This week on the RTS podcast, Mike and I interview IPF world record holder Matt Baller on the proper technique for eating a fruit roll up. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Uh, we've got another RTS podcast for you today. I'm Mike Tashir. Uh, I've got Adam Palmer on the other end with me. And here, our guest today, uh, we've got Matt Baller. Uh, if you don't know who Matt Baller is, uh, you should. Uh, he's the current IPF world record holder in the raw bench press. He's done 260.5 kilos. That's 574 pounds uh, at super heavy weight. So uh, Matt's got clearly a, a, a well, obviously world class, a world record bench press. So uh, we're going to be talking about bench pressing. We're going to be talking about training and eating fruit roll ups and whatever else we can think of uh, today. So Matt. Um, Thanks for being here today, man. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, just so, yeah, to... just for people that don't know you or anything like that, uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from, how you ended up there, stuff okay. like that. Yeah, so I originally grew up in a small town in Nebraska called Milligan. Um, it's a town of 312 people. And uh, Graduated, went to college in a small town outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. Met my wife there, and uh, I played college football and threw shot put and discus and hammer on the college track team as well. And that just kind of got me into the sport of well, in the lifting, trying to be better for football and track. And then uh, so I met my wife and her family. They moved up to Alaska. <clears throat> About five years ago, uh, they're originally from Colorado, and she wanted to move up here to be closer to them, and I wanted to come up and go hunting and fishing, so it just kind of worked out. And when I got up here, I was doing strongman. I started doing strongman in Nebraska, and uh, I was okay at it, but I wasn't that great. So <clears throat> when we moved up to Alaska, there wasn't strongman up here. There was powerlifting, so I gave powerlifting a shot. And turned out I was a lot better at powerlifting than strongman, so I just stuck with powerlifting. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Um, are you, for, for people that don't know, are you like classic um, awesome bench presser build? Or, like, yeah. you see some people that are like super, like, it's obvious that they're good bench pressers. They've got these uh, short arms. You know, the T Rex. Yeah, then other people, Jen Thompson, are not obviously bench pressers. So, where do you fall on that line? I think I have a good classic bench presser type of build. Um, my arms, I don't think they're extremely short, but they're short enough. And then my, I have a big uh, chest. and um, So kind of the opposite of what you'd want for, for strongman. I mean, obviously, yeah. uh, apart yeah. from being just big, but <laughs> the, the yeah. wingspan thing is not really in your favor on strongman stuff, right? Yeah. For everybody's... For, Reference, how much do you weigh, Matt, just so people have an idea? Um, right now I'm at 300 pounds. So, so Matt's okay. a big dude. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm a big dude, but I'm small for the super heavyweight weight class. <laughs> I yeah, feel like. yeah, that's, that's true. Where do where mo most of your competitors end up uh, weighing in? Uh, you know? So you got Blaine Sumner and Ray Williams. They're, I think they float around 360 to 370. And then... Uh, after that, I mean, Brad Gillingham, he's probably, what, 330 or so? Uh, yeah, I think he's there, maybe even more than that. But, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, proof enough, right? You're yeah. uh, on the, the smaller end of the heavyweight spectrum. But, exactly. <laughs> you know, that aside, like you mentioned, Blaine and, and Ray, yeah. um, that's kind of become a stacked weight class. Oh, man. You know, especially in, in the last couple of years. Yeah, it's kind of daunting going against those guys. It's just those guys are <laughs> just so strong. Yeah, but you're another guy that's like you've got like a second squat. Your bench is so good. I mean, yeah, that's, that's really what it is. Yeah, the bench really helps carry me because my deadlift is horrible, and I, that's due to my um, <laughs> your bencher bencher yeah. build doesn't help with yeah. deadlift very good. No. <laughs> what are your uh, squat and bench number or squat and deadlift numbers rather? Uh, my best squat is 330 kilos or 727 pounds, 
And then my best deadlift is 310 kilos, 683 pounds. So, yeah, I mean, we're not talking about shabby numbers or anything, but no, uh, no. like I'm saying, like, it's just a stacked weight class, you know, like when you're competing yeah. against Blaine yeah. and, and Ray, it's just... Yeah, I'm coming up on a big milestone for myself. I'm hoping to hit a 2,000-pound total in my next nice. meet, which, nice. you know, used to be good in the super heavyweight class. Now you got <laughs> Ray bumping it up to 2,200 and <laughs> Blaine at, like, 2,150, so... <laughs> So when what, is your next competition, Matt? My next one, I'm going to be doing the starting strength pro raw challenge at the Arnold, and then I'll be doing the SSP nutrition uh, raw bench contest the next, the following day, um, on March 7th at the Arnold. Awesome! So that'll be a busy weekend for you. <laughs> yeah, <Right>? yeah. <laughs> Have you done back-to-back uh, -back competitions like that? I did last year at the Arnold. I did the same two, and I thought it was going to be pretty rough on me. I had quite a bit of shoulder pain last year at the Arnold, and I came out and I was able to set a world record in the bench press, and then the next day I was able to do the same exact weight, so I was pretty happy about that performance. Have you found that you've had to uh, adjust your training, or, or Matt's had to, Matt Gary's had to adjust your training because of potential injuries? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was dealing with the shoulder pain back at the Arnold, and then right before um, I went to Worlds last year, it started to go away. I was lifting a little bit lighter, and that helped get rid of the pain. I, I must have had some inflammation or something in my shoulder. And uh, <clears throat> it went away and then went to Nationals and felt great. And then shortly after Nationals, the pain came back, and, so I did, I did a long, probably about three months after nationals where I just did light, lighter bench pressing and um, I can still feel a little bit of pain in my shoulder, but it's definitely nowhere where it used to be. Have you had any uh, focus on prehab, rehab specific things, like maybe, maybe something that the listeners could use to help with shoulder pain? Um, so yeah, I did a lot of mobility work and then... Um, ice in and stem and I got a portable uh, tens unit that I would hook up right after I got done bench press and I work out in my garage at home so as soon as I did my last rep I ran inside threw the ice pack on it and the turned stem on machine and turned on frozen while yeah. your while your little girls yeah, watching that's right. <laughs> yeah watch a little cartoons with the child <laughs> <laughs> so uh I kind of had a similar experience this past year you know not directly with shoulder stuff but just getting beat up in general. Uh, that was a, a a tough schedule, you know, to compete in Worlds and then turn around and compete in Nationals like a yeah. month later. Mm -hmm. So I did something real similar. I took, gosh, a, a couple months of, you know, light training and, and just not training a whole lot to mm -hmm. get myself put back together. Are, yeah. Do you feel like you're mostly back in shape from that? or Yeah, is I, it I feel... Still uh, yeah, I feel like uh, I've progressed from it, and uh, yeah. things are. I'm starting to get back to normal, and um, I should have yeah. a pretty good peaking cycle for coming into the Arnold here in a few weeks. Good stuff. Yeah. I think it took me more than more than a couple months because let's see, it was August, and then September, my son was born, and then you mm -hmm. know that bleeds over into a couple months. So it, you know, at three or four months of you know very little training, I'm still yeah. trying to get myself back into shape but yeah it, it takes a while um, but I'm glad to hear that you're moving ahead with that that's yeah good. yeah the shoulder doing okay yeah. um, and then yeah I had a another little girl born in November so that was oh congrats yeah um, so she's about three months old now and you know just having kids and family and um, I just threw my my trainings all over the place. I don't have set days where I go in and do stuff just because uh, up here in Alaska, the jobs are all in Anchorage, but Anchorage is so expensive to live in. I live about 52 miles one way from my job, so I commute that every day, about 104 miles. and Sometimes it's hour and a half if it's a good day on the way home. Some days it's two, two and a half hours, depending if there's snow or something. Or somebody hits a moose, <laughs> that always <laughs> backs up the highway. 
But, uh, yeah, and there's only one road in and out of Anchorage to Wasilla, where I live. So if someone gums it up by getting in a wreck or something, it screws it up. <clears throat> so the point with all that is when I get home, I have, like, three or four hours of free time before I need to go to bed to wake up and go to work the next day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having kids, you want to get home and spend time with them and your wife. And I usually wait till they all go to sleep and it's about nine thirty, ten o'clock by the time I go to the train. And sometimes I'm just too tired. So I feel like I'll just go to sleep and try and do it the next day. So I, I do all my bench on one day and, uh, I usually hit it real hard, pretty intense, a lot of volume, and um, I like to try and set a like a new rep or weight record almost every um, workout. Just I don't know, that helps me keeps me going. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> so you're training mostly late at, later at night. Yeah, uh, which is. The, so when did you start that? Did you start that when uh, the kiddos were born? Yeah, pretty much, yeah, when they were born because I get home and I'm just starving because I haven't eaten for like seven hours or something because of work okay. and my lunch schedule. And when I get so home, uh, what eat. effects did you notice? Like, did, Was it one of those things like just, well, after a while you more or less get used to it or is it something that you had to – I don't know what what kind of things did you have to do to get used to it. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm really used to it quite yet, because <laughs> ideally I would like to train at least four or five days a week. And right now I'm lucky if I get three, maybe four. And uh, it's just a really inconsistent schedule. I mean, I try to <clears throat> get everything in at least once a week, but I would prefer to bench twice a week and squat at least twice a week but a lot of times it's once a week for those things and it just kind of depends yeah. no way to how i feel that night when i get home <laughs> no way to set up a rack at your job or well what do you do for a living will that even work <laughs> no i mean i have plenty of energy i could do it over my lunch hour but uh they they wouldn't let me set anything up um, <laughs> i do yeah, I I imagine that out. working out <laughs> yeah well, sell, so what, do you, what do you do? I'm curious. I sell uh, road construction supplies for a um, company in Anchorage. And Alaska is so underdeveloped with the, the road system. There's just a lot of uh, road construction projects and then oil and gas. So I sell to those types of customers. Gotcha. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, training by yourself in, in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I'm a, a guy that's trained by myself uh, for, gosh, a long time as mm -hmm. well. So uh, people are always kind of amazed when they're like, oh, my God, you train by yourself, uh, <laughs> you know, even the, with the weights that you're handling and stuff like that. So what kind of stuff do you do uh, to make that bearable or, you know, uh, to break up the monotony or, or even just to make sure that you're doing it safely? Um, well, I try to make sure I'm not going to get hurt with anything. I, I do weights that I know I can do or should be able to handle. Then I make sure all the racks and safety bars are in the right place. Um, yeah. As far as training alone, that's pretty much the only way I've ever trained. So I just kind of got used to it. And then <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, how yeah. else? You know, I mean, you've got work. It needs to be done. So what else yeah. would you do, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. you know, yeah. you'll notice, I think, if you if you start training with a partner, that your rest sets, depending on your partner anyway, may go down. And I actually think I get wiped out quicker training with a partner. Like it's, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Dude. Yeah, I prefer oh, to man, train I, by myself. I, <laughs> I actually go way faster if I have a, a partner. Like if, uh, I mean, I said that wrong. I go way faster if I'm training by myself. Like having a partner there, uh -huh. I mean, I don't know if I, if I just talk too much or what, but that definitely <laughs> seems to slow me down. Yeah, that's yeah. how I feel. I mean, I train with people every once in a while, and it's usually longer rest breaks in between sets. And yeah, um, I'm usually pretty pretty quick when I'm training by myself. Yeah, I mean, like you've got to be focused when you are approaching the weights, but 
I don't know, like between sets. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this, and I'm sure, Matt, you're in the same boat as me. Like, I've been doing this for like 18 years. Yeah. Uh, the time for being angry and stuff and, and keeping that psych, you know, between sets even, you know, like that's uh, exhausting. <laughs> yep. You know, you just spend a great deal of your life being angry if you did that. So, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to get to a point where you can kind of relax between sets, and I think that that maybe leads to things taking a bit longer. If you're, that's, yeah. uh, that's kind of a great point. Matt, do you, do you find that you – stay pretty even keel when you go into training sets? Like, you don't have to get psyched up for, for big weights? Oh, uh, for big weights, I have to get psyched up. Um, and something that I, I do, like, a mental preparation for that day. So if I'm going to be benching, I have to just think about benching heavy all day. Otherwise, if I get into the, the gym later that day, that night, when I go in, I just, I'm not in the right mindset. And my, it's really weird how it happens, but... For me, I just have to think about doing that session all day long. Otherwise, I just can't do the weights for some reason. <laughs> wow. So what's a session for you like normally? I mean, uh, look, I, I know that that's a terrible question and no sessions, uh, like sessions are always different. But just like typically, what are we talking about? So like, what do you mean? Can you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> but like... Uh, like a typical bench session, like how many movements are we talking about? Like how much time does it take you to to do a standard bench session? How many sets? Okay. Uh, typically, of course, it always changes and it depends. But uh, yeah. I'm just trying to get a feel for what a normal uh, bench session is like for you. Yeah, so a normal bench session, about I'd say about 45 minutes. Um, I go in, I do a warm-up, and I usually do – probably five to eight sets, working sets, and um, I just try and, you know, a lot of volume and intensity, yeah. heaviness, because um, <laughs> 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 I, I, I try to get at least three or four days rest before I go on bench again. I know a lot of people try to train a lot. Yeah. Yeah, a lot more. Um do you think your frequency, if you could improve your frequency, you might see better results? Or do you find that you have really been able to just cram a lot of volume in a really short amount of time and get really good results that way? Yeah, exactly what you just said there. Because um, I used to bench probably every other day, and the my gains weren't that coming as easy. And then all of a sudden, when I started you know, putting three, four days rest in between, my bench actually started shooting up, so I think the extra rest time actually had something to do with it. See, that's a that's an interesting thing, and I, I don't know. I'm gonna go go ahead and, and and talk about this for a second, but and I'm probably gonna regret it. But uh, <laughs> just as a, a concept, something that I've been thinking about playing with uh, more recently is just this idea of maybe there's like a, a minimum fatigue threshold, you know, like you, you need to do enough work to cause enough fatigue, um, mm -hmm. you know, for a session to, to really have a, much of a developmental stimulus. And, I mean, I don't know. Uh, there's definitely evidence for and evidence against. Like, Matt, what you're talking about, I would say, is, is like evidence for there being some kind of minimum fatigue. You know, like if you, if you spread your workout too much, you know, yeah, okay, you're doing all this work and it's uh, got a higher frequency and all this stuff, but uh, maybe maybe the work doesn't really uh, get a chance to benefit you because it's not enough work all at once, you know. But on the other hand, you have people who train with really high frequencies and spread that work out, and that works well for them too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason that these things work for people, so it's yeah. just a matter of more work to be done as far as figuring out why things work for, for different people, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, Matt, have you ever tried uh, equipped benching or equipped lifting in general? I have not. I have, uh, no? no, I actually got a funny story about a squat suit that I bought one time um, <laughs> back in college. I, I bought it off the Internet, and I had no idea what I was doing. The only reason I, it was like a really cheap one. 
and I just wanted to freak my buddy out at the gym <laughs> and uh, like the hundred pounds on my squat the next day or something and just freak him out. But I couldn't even get the darn thing on. So I was like, what the world? <laughs> so I gave, I gave up on that. But I've been thinking about trying to get into a, a geared bench competition or um, sometime maybe this year or in the future just to give it a yeah. shot. But this uh, might be a bad I, question for this forum, yeah. but do you ever use a slingshot? I, I have never. Um, I don't really have that much equipment so or money, so I'd, I just work with the bare minimum. I got a rack in the garage with a bar and some weights, and that's yeah. pretty much all I have. Well, I mean, clearly it's enough to produce a world record bench press, so I don't think you're yeah. you're missing a whole lot. But yeah. I, I do think it would be interesting to to see you play around with a bench shirt. You know, but yeah. I don't know. But, I'm curious too. Uh, like you hear uh, different anecdotes now and then uh, about people that uh, do some equipped training and that have a positive carryover to their their raw lifting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't say that for sure, but I, I know when I was doing equipped uh, competitions, uh, I was doing less work raw, but it wasn't like my raw lifts were way down or anything like that. So. Yeah. Um, there is definitely some transference. I mean, I don't think it's, I mean, I don't think training and equipment is like the ideal way to prep for a raw meat or anything, but yeah, uh, it would be interesting to see, you know, what kind of effects it would have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I agree. But, yeah, man. So, um, uh, you've got the Arnold coming up and then I saw something, you've got something coming up after that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, fortunate enough. I, um, offered a invitation down to Melbourne, Australia for the Pacific Invitational in April. Um, so I'm really excited about that. It'll be my first time going to Australia. And, awesome, uh, man. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. It's going to be a cool trip. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. That's always fun. That, that, that's such a cool powerlifting community that they have uh, in Australia. I, I really like hanging out with the Aussies and, and – uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and, and just, like, the whole culture of powerlifting that's down there is uh, is really, I don't know, It's it, I think it's one of the best features of the sport, to be honest. So mm -hmm. you, you're going to have a really good time down there. Yeah, it should be awesome. So really looking forward to it. So we're, we're kind of coming close on time, but a couple things that I wanted to find out from you okay. while, we've, while we've got your ear here. Uh, first thing is, why do you always look at your right arm when you bench? <laughs> um, so I have a couple reasons. I don't know for sure <laughs> which one is actually true. Um, <laughs> so I have uh, my right eye is lazy, and uh, I don't have very good peripheral vision out of it. So I think um, maybe I look at it the right side to make sure that the weight's coming down right and all that, and then the other reason is the that right shoulder is the one that I've had uh, problems with and injuries and pain and stuff. So I'm guessing it oh. might be either a mixture of that or it's one or the other. I don't know for sure, but for some reason I so, gotta look at that right side. <laughs> I was just hoping like that was that was your secret, and like if I started doing that, that I would <laughs> I would add ten or twenty kilos to my bench. <laughs> It probably would. So I, you should probably do a trial run with it. See if Definitely it look at the right arm. As yeah. you know. <laughs> I've heard other people are doing it too. You know, I've had similar experience with the the weird pressure breathing thing that I do on the deadlift. Uh -huh. You know, uh, people will be like, "Hey, wh why do you do that?" And I'm like, yeah. "I don't know. It just seems to help." <laughs> you know, I, I, I do better when I do that. You know. Uh -huh. uh, but then, like, you hear some people will, like, hey, man, I tried that out, and, and I, I like it. I really like it. You know, I'm going to start doing it all the time. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> of course, the people that try it and, and they're like, wow, what the heck was that about? I hated yeah. that. Uh, they, don't, they don't come and tell me about it. So, <laughs> so I'm only getting one side of the story. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, all right, man. Uh, I think that's about, that's about all the questions I had for you. Um, uh -huh. We're so ready. Pretty, pretty glimpse inside the the life of a world record venture. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for uh, <laughs> thanks for having me, guys. No, thank you for yeah. coming on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no problem, man.
So, so we got a little bit of time left, though. Um, should probably uh, do our shameless plugs for the uh, the seminar, and then we'll talk about the level one a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, two big things going up in the uh, world of RTS. First, we talked a little bit last week about uh, the seminar coming up in Florida. It's going to be May first through the third. It's going to be in Fort Lauderdale. So, if you live in Florida, you should definitely come to this. It's going to be uh, myself. Uh, Dr. Mike Zordos, Matt Gary, Susie Hartwig Gary, and uh, Ben Escrow. Uh, so a pretty, pretty heavy hitting lineup. Uh, a lot of top coaches. Uh, you know, it, it, lots of really great knowledge is going to be uh, dispensed over the course of about three days. So if you live in Florida, you should definitely think about coming out to that. And if you don't live in Florida, I mean, it's May 1st through the 3rd. It's in South Florida. Maybe you should consider vacation around that time. I mean, that's all That's all I'm saying. We've got the pre-registration going on right now, so uh, sign up now. Save a little money when you're doing it. Um, it's in plenty of time to make your travel arrangements. It's going to be a really fun experience. So um, we'll put a link up for that, too, uh, that will have, like, our full schedule uh, descriptions of the topics and speaker bios and locations and basically all the information that you'd want to know. And of course, if there's anything else, just uh, ask me and I'll be glad to fill you in. And then, Adam, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about the the level one because you've been doing most of the work on that. So right. yeah. let it rip, man. Yeah, man. Uh, so so the, the RTS level one, um, my background is in, uh, uh, I, I have a background in, in professional curriculum development for the Air Force. Um, the fact that I'm in the Air Force is no real secret, but most people don't realize that uh, one of my assignments, I spent about three years doing professional curriculum development for uh, uh, one of the training pipelines in the Air Force. And uh, so I've had the unique opportunity to be able to carry that over into my work here with RTS. And that's coming online as in the form of a uh, level one certificate course. Uh, the the content is going to be based off of what some of the things you've seen in RTS Classroom, if you've been participating in that, and, and the core fundamental parts of the RTS manual. Um, and, so, and so what that's going to look like is right now we've got 11 lessons uh, based around um, RTS fundamentals, um, programming you know, for, for power lifters, for strength athletes, and it gets really heavy in the programming. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah, it gets really heavy in the programming stuff. And I know a lot of people will ask about that, like how do I learn how to write a good program? And the truth is there's not a lot of good resources out there. It's not like a, there's a book that you can read or anything, and now you know how to write a good training program. So this course really emphasizes program design because I think that's a skill that a lot of people want and a lot of people need. So hopefully you do, well, that's one of our major goals with this, right, is that you come out of the other end knowing how to write a good program. He said do-do. But, yeah, <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so, so when you, you take the course, um, and at the end of the course, there's, there's going to be a proctored uh, online test that when you pass the test, if you, I guess we haven't really decided what the percent passing rate is going to be, but um, you pass the test, you get a certificate, and then, you know, uh, you get, get a certificate mailed to you, and, uh, and you can frame it and put it on your wall, and, and whenever uh, somebody asks, you know, you know, what are your coaching credentials like, you can say, well, I've, I've got an RTS Level 1 certificate, and if they know anything about that, they will know that, well, they took a proctored test, which isn't something that every certificate or certification does. Um, and it, it actually means something. This person knows, understands the fundamentals that we want you to, we want to impart to you about programming and uh, program design and uh, using auto regulation in those programs. So, yeah, it's going to be yeah. good. really stoked. Yeah. So uh, a lot of the lessons, like uh, like Adam said, uh, were covered in uh, some of the early uh, RTS classroom things that we did, and there's a lot of good feedback about those too. So uh, anyway, we won't uh, 
really belabor the point, but that's going to be coming online probably around March, right? Sometime in March is what we're shooting yeah, late, for. Yeah, late March, April is hopefully when we're trying to get yeah. everything set up. Yeah, so if uh, uh, keep your ear out for that, and we'll have, have more details to follow with that. But um, other than that, uh, we won't take up any more of uh, any more of your time. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to thank Matt again. Thanks for hanging out, man. I uh, really appreciate it, and thanks for uh, uh, chatting with us. Uh, for anybody, uh, if you're interested in watching a podcast live, uh, you can sign up for the RTS newsletter. Uh, we're going to start doing that. Uh, at some point in the near future, uh, we'll get you guys in here. Uh, you can ask questions to our, our guests, uh, things like that, and just kind of hang out with us a little bit. Um, yeah, sign up for the newsletter for more information about that. That's going to be an invite that's sent uh, exclusively to, to newsletter subscribers, uh, and we'll post up some links uh, for that stuff as well. So uh, just remember, as always, make sure that you guys stay focused on your training, uh, stay focused on your thinking as well. And uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.